Hey, space fans, Tarek Malik, editor-in-chief of Space.com here at NASA's Kennedy Space Center, Kennedy Space Center, um, where we are uh, L minus one day uh, to the launch of NASA's Artemis One mission to the moon. I can see the rocket right over here on the launch pad. You can see that, that view right now. There's some storm clouds uh, that they're dealing with, but they're hoping that that's not going to be an issue for launch. And so I just wanted to take some time. You know, we're, we're less than less than 24 hours uh, almost uh, from the, the mission. Launch is on Saturday, September 3rd at 2.17 p.m. Uh, Eastern time. And, uh, and everything seems like it's uh, okay to go. We got an update today from um, NASA's Jeremy Parsons and their weather officer, Melody uh, Lovin. And they, they seem to think that, uh, that tomorrow might be the day. Now, uh, if you've been following space.com, you will have known that NASA did try to launch this uh, historic first test flight of their space launch system and Orion spacecraft on Artemis One to the moon on the 29th of August. They did not uh, make it because they had an engine cooling issue uh, while they were fueling the rocket. Since then, in the last few days, engineers have realized that they think it's a bad sensor on that rocket itself, not not the an issue with the engine uh, or uh, uh, or or the the mechanics of it, but that they have an, a, a sensor that's just not saying that the the engine is as cold as it needs to be when in fact the engine is fine. So with that with that in mind, they are looking forward to a uh, to a launch. Uh, the weather we found out today is 60% go at that uh, that launch time at 2:17. If they have to wait a couple of hours because they do have two hours in which they can launch this mission, uh, the weather gets better. It gets up to 80% go, which is surprising for a summer here in Florida, in my experience, but that's what they're saying right now. Uh, they do have one backup day right now. That's uh, Monday, September 5th. That is Labor Day. So we could be looking at a Labor Day launch if they don't get off the ground on Saturday. But right now, so far, everything seems uh, like uh, like they're, they're ready to go, uh, barring some new glitch or, or the weather. Um, I did speak with NASA astronaut Anne McLean today, and she's really excited uh, to see this take off because, uh, as you might imagine, she's on the list as one of the possible astronauts that could go uh, to the moon. And she said that um, exploration is in uh, her blood, in all of our blood. That's why NASA really wants to go uh, to the moon with this mission. Uh, it's an uncrewed flight around the moon uh, that will then set the stage for those crewed flights to go uh, later on. And that's kind of the stage right now. You know, if everything goes well, they'll launch. It'll take... Um, a 37 day trip uh, to the moon uh, and back and it'll land on October 11th. And uh, hopefully we'll see uh, a really good show. Now it is starting to rain uh, a little bit here. Rain is one of the, the concerns uh, for tomorrow, but they don't—they really don't think it's gonna be that big of an issue at launch time, but they'll see it early in the, in the countdown itself. Um, and uh, just a couple more milestones before I take some questions. Uh, on Saturday morning, NASA's broadcast will begin about the 5.45 a.m. Eastern time, uh, if you folks are looking to tune in and you really want to watch, that's when they're going to start fueling the rocket itself. And then about 12.15, around lunchtime, that's when NASA's big broadcast will start. And the launch, of course, is uh, two hours into that, 2.17. And if everything goes well, we'll see some views from the Orion spacecraft uh, of Earth in the late Saturday night launch. So NASA might have some Saturday night fever looking at the Earth from the Orion spacecraft as it's on the way to the moon. So that's our big recap right now. And if you've got some questions, uh, I think uh, uh, my producer, Judy, might have some uh, in the background. Judy, what do we got? Well, we got a question from Camilo Andres. He wants to know, what is the main objective for Artemis One? Well, the, no, well, that's a, that's a great question, uh, Camille. The, the main objective for this mission is just to show that the rocket you're looking at and the spacecraft on top work. NASA has spent over a decade, uh, billions upon billions of dollars on this vehicle, and they really want to make sure that it's safe enough that when they want to fly it again with people on board, uh, that those astronauts will be safe. That crewed mission, Artemis II, is right now supposed to fly in the 2024 timeframe, but it all depends on this flight. So the, the first big test is, of course, they're going to launch a space launch system. You'll see that lift off the pad. They'll make sure that that works. Uh, then when they want to get the uh, Orion spacecraft to the moon, that's the next big test. Uh, see how it performs around the moon. Uh, and then they want to get it back. You know, it's going to come screaming back towards the Earth from the moon at 25,000 miles an hour, Mach 23 or 25 or something like that. It's a, something just mind boggling. Uh, it'll heat up like 5,000 degrees. That's like half 
the temperature of the sun, uh, and then they're going to fish it out of the ocean. It'll land with some parachutes, splash down in the Pacific Ocean off the coast of California, and they want to make sure that astronauts can survive comfortably and safely the entire time. So that's that's the primary objective. Now, there there is a bunch of stuff inside the Orion spacecraft. There are uh, three mannequins in there to test what the astronauts would feel like. Uh, they have uh, uh, Some of them have th- uh, uh, hundreds of sensors to test the radiation environment, what the vibration is like, uh, what the temperatures are like uh, for astronauts uh, on this long voyage. Uh, the, the mission is longer than what a trip to the moon would be because they really want to put the Orion spacecraft through its paces. Uh, and then uh, they have some CubeSats also on that uh, space launch system rocket that they're going to uh, pop out on the way to the moon. And some of those are going to go in orbit. One's going to try to land on the moon. Another one is going to use a solar sail to go to a, an asteroid, a little, a little asteroid. Uh, and all of those technologies are also aimed at testing different kind of things that NASA thinks they're going to need to get to the moon. But the primary objective is uh, test the Orion spacecraft, get it back, and fly the, uh, uh, the SLS rocket uh, successfully. I mean, that, that sounds great. Uh, Dave Maynard <laughs> actually has a question uh, that has been coming up a lot lately about uh, could a solar storm impact the launch this weekend? Yeah, you know, that's a really great question because we've been seeing a lot more activity from the sun. Even uh, this in the, in the days leading up to the, uh, this launch attempt, we've seen um, several strong flares uh, from the sun. We did ask this question uh, on, I want to say like on Sunday, like the day before launch, uh, the first launch attempt on August 29th. And NASA did say that, that they've taken a look at the sun's environment now, and they've built a lot of the radiation hardness into the vehicle itself. So its, it's components are shielded uh, against what NASA expects to see. One of the big tests for this mission is what is that radiation environment like beyond low Earth orbit? The International Space Station, where astronauts have flown for you know, about over 20 years, uh, as well as the space shuttle missions, they are all in the protective Van Allen belts around the Earth. And that's a, 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 an area that kind of filters out the worst of the solar radiation that the Earth gets hit from the sun uh, over time. Uh, Going out to the moon, Orion is going to go farther than any crew-capable spacecraft has gone before, about 40,000 miles beyond the moon. That's about 290,000 miles away from Earth. And so they're going to see a higher radiation environment. So they said that the spacecraft is built to handle that. In fact, there's a a designated region deep inside the capsule that will be a radiation kind of storm shelter. or their, Their storage lockers that the astronauts would be able to climb inside, according to the folks at Lockheed Martin, who I spoke with, who built this spacecraft. Um, so for this mission, they're not worried about an actual solar flare disrupting it d- during that month because they think the vehicle is hardened enough uh, for it. But that is an issue for astronauts on the surface because they will have to have their own shelters once they're actually there uh, working and, and, and living on the surface of the moon. Very cool. Very cool. Just looking through the. I'm, I'm not. I'm not sure if you've noticed, but it's actually started to drizzle a bit here uh, from the clouds behind me that you can see. So. I'm glad you moved under the awning. Then don't want to ruin. Yes. Don't want to get you electrocuted. We already have enough. That's, that's, that's right. <laughs> so we have another question. Uh, this is from Newton Koshi. Uh, they want to know: Could the lunar rovers already on the moon be repurposed? That's a that's a good question. Right now, NASA doesn't have an active lunar rover on the moon. There are, uh, there is one, uh, China's uh, Chang'e 4 rover, uh, U-22 is on the moon uh, and doing doing good work. But NASA has plans for uh, a several, it's kind of like a robotic in, invasion of the moon coming up in the next a year or two. Uh, several companies, one of them is Astrobotic, uh, there's a few others, uh, are, have built their own private moon rovers. And some of those are for NASA in particular. NASA wants to launch a, a, a rover called Viper, built by JPL to the, to the south pole of the moon to look for water. Um, and they're, they're basically going to be launching these different parts of either the lunar south pole or just different parts of the moon in general. Some of them have NASA experiments on them. Some of them have uh, commercial uh, rovers on, on commercial landers. And the whole goal is to fill either a commercial need that NASA, NASA wants to explore this type of crater or this type of moon dirt. Uh, or to look for the things astronauts will need. Viper, in particular, will be looking for ice on the moon and will drill into the South Pole, which is where NASA wants to put astronauts because they want to, uh, pardon me, they want to actually uh, use that ice to make uh, air, to make uh, fuel, uh, to make all sorts of good stuff that they're going to need when they get there. 
So they won't be able to repurpose those missions because they're not there yet, uh, but they will be able to use them to learn more about how the moon works and what other types of robot systems astronauts are gonna need to help them in their daily work. Well, that's exciting. Actually, and I have one, one interesting thing. I was talking to Jim Free, NASA's uh, uh, chief of, uh, uh, of their, their exploration mission development, and, and he said something really interesting about what, uh, what a, a future moon rover will look like uh, for astronauts. And if you think of those buggies that the Apollo astronauts uh, drive around on the lunar surface, you know, they drive it, they park, they get up, they walk away. Uh, NASA is looking at a, a buggy like that that will have a robotic arm on it so that the astronauts will be able to like drive around, use that robotic arm, uh, do their science, come back home, uh, leave their moon base, and then when they're not there, NASA could use uh, people on the Earth commanding the robot to go around and do its own things too. That is one way that NASA wants to try to get the most out of the new equipment they're gonna be launching there. Uh, and then if it's not NASA using uh, that robotic option for the rover, they might have scientists that wanna use it uh, or even commercial partners. Uh, and so that is one thing that they're already starting to look at. And we see that on the International Space Station with the robotic arm there, the Canada Arm 2, where astronauts don't have to be in the driver's seat of that robot, uh, that robot arm all the time. Flight, uh, flight controllers on the ground can do it, save astronauts some time, get more done. That's really cool. I was just thinking, oh, everybody's doing remote work, but NASA's really been the originators of remote work, huh? That's right. That's right. Talk about uh, uh, working working from uh, uh, from from home. Uh, some <laughs> of these astronauts have been working from their home office, uh, 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 260 miles above Earth, for the last six months or so. And when they get to uh, the moon, that's uh, that's I think the epitome of remote work. Until of course they get to Mars, which I should point out, this entire program is aimed at developing all the tools that NASA and astronauts will need to live and work on Mars. Uh, everything that they test here, they want to make sure that they test it with Mars in mind. Oh my gosh, yeah, work from home, a whole new new definition, work from home planet, home office. Um, so Susie Adams has a great question. Um, why doesn't NASA co-op with Elon Musk and others to jointly develop these projects? Yeah, well, Susie, actually, that's it. in fact what NASA is doing. One of the big lessons NASA has learned in the last 10 to 15 years is that they don't always have to build every single thing themselves. They can be a customer. And a really good example of that is the fact that uh, uh, SpaceX and Elon Musk, they are partners with NASA to provide astronaut flights to the International Space Station and back. Uh, there's a few others. Boeing is another company that's doing that. Those companies that I mentioned earlier, Astrobotic, uh, um, uh, Firefly Aerospace is a launch company that's going to be launching private uh, moon, moon missions uh, for NASA. Um, those partnerships all evolved from the work that they did on the International Space Station. Elon Musk in particular is building a giant rocket called Starship, and NASA has picked it to be the first lander to put the astronauts on the first crewed landing on the moon uh, of this program uh, there in about the 2025 uh, time frame. So the, the Starship that you may have seen pictures of that uh, SpaceX has been testing in Texas is going to land on the moon at least twice because uh, NASA does want them to do like an uncrewed test before they actually land astronauts there. Uh, and, uh, and so they are kind of evolving that model. And that is something that is going to evolve uh, not just for moon landings, but they want to build a, a space station around the moon called Gateway. Uh, SpaceX is in the running for a cargo uh, delivery ship uh, for that, as is uh, Northrop Grumman. Northrop Grumman is building a habitat module for that space station, while Maxar, a satellite system, is building the power system for it. And you see a lot of that cooperation going on. And it's not just those companies like SpaceX and and uh, 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 and, and the like, Blue Origin and uh, a few others are trying to compete for another moon lander. Uh, and NASA is also working with their international partners. So Canada will be providing a robotic arm for that space station. Uh, and uh, Europe will be providing uh, you know, other types of things. They're providing the service module for the Orion spacecraft on, on the, um, the, the vehicle right now. So a lot of those partnerships, NASA has learned that they, you know, they, over, over the years, they really can do that together uh, and get maybe a, a more affordable and a longer lasting program out of it. That's really cool. I think that's all the questions we have now. I know uh, people are gonna definitely be asking questions for tomorrow. So yeah, you know, so tomorrow's gonna be a really interesting day. Uh, we'll all be watching the fueling part of the, the countdown very carefully. I'm going to hopefully try to get a few hours of sleep tonight um, and then come back in uh, a few hours before fueling because that's when they have to make the decision. Is the weather okay enough to start fueling? Because uh, if you did watch 
the first countdown, uh, you may have seen that they were delayed by about an hour to start the fueling process. And the fueling alone takes about three to four hours because they have to fill this 322 foot rocket, 32 stories with 736,000 gallons of fuel. That's so much fuel that if they, if they scrub, they got to spend a couple of days to actually fill up the tanks uh, that they have here on site before they can try again. And so uh, they really want that to go smoothly, but they can't start it if there's lightning, a lightning risk within five miles of the pad. That's what we saw during the first launch attempt. And so they, the weather's going to be really, really interesting going into that. They could save a few minutes of time if they get delayed, but that's why they have a two-hour launch window. And luckily, the weather does get better during that launch window. So you know, that's the first big step to look, to look for. Very cool. Well, good luck tomorrow. Um... Keep looking up, I guess. That's right. That's right. We'll keep looking up. Uh, and of course, if you want to watch the launch, we'll have the live broadcast on space.com. Uh, we'll also have a, 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 simul, a simulcast by, uh, there's some folks uh, here called Felix and Paul who are providing a, an immersive 360 degree uh, view of what the launch is going to be like. You can uh, check that out both on our site as well as through their own uh, their own Facebook page at Space Explorers. And they'll also be streaming live on Facebook Meta if you've got a VR Oculus that you can actually sit there on the ground and see what it's like to feel uh, to to stand and watch this thing launch, uh, and of course uh, we'll be here after the fact after it gets into space. It's it's not done yet. Launch is just the first step. It's got 37 more days uh, to get to the moon to get back. Uh, we'll we'll have a, a a translunar injection they call it, an actual that, that's when they fire the engine to go to the moon and leave Earth orbit. That's a few hours after launch. Uh, then we'll have those first photos. A Saturday night. So, you know, fingers crossed. It's going to be a long day, but it should be a pretty amazing day. Awesome, Tark. Great. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you, Judy. Thank you, uh, uh, Producer Mary. Thank you all for, for, for watching this. And I hope you're all as excited as I am. Uh, it's the biggest rocket I've ever seen. And I think it's the biggest rocket anyone alive right now uh, may have seen since the Saturn V. Well, space fans, uh, I'm not sure if you can see, but it has actually really started raining here at the Kennedy Space Center press site so, uh, and, and launch pad uh, 39B. I think that's my cue to leave you for today. Uh, but hopefully we're going to have uh, a pristine weather, a good weather forecast for tomorrow. I've got a story coming about that later today, but uh, I'll see you then. And let's hope for the best for this.